Uh, right now, I'd like to take up some questions, if any exist. Did anybody write down any questions? Are you going to read out, Jonathan? We only have one microphone, so can you folks in the back hear me? Okay. Dear Master, I find it hard to visualize things during meditation. Still, involuntarily, very vivid images show up. Why is this, and how can I learn to visualize things more clearly? I find it hard to visualize things during meditation. Still, involuntarily, very vivid images show up. Why is this? And how can I learn to visualize things more clearly? The mind visualizes things by itself all the time. During longer meditation sessions with me, I will tell you how to observe the mind, which means you separate yourself from the mind and see what it does. It constantly visualizes bizarre images, bizarre thoughts. Constantly. It's a random thing. It does it all the time. Day and night. It's part of the life of a mind. Just like the body, heart has to beat all the time to keep this body alive. The mind has to think all the time to keep it alive. So it's natural for the mind to do these things. So if the mind is not controlled, it will keep on doing these things. Therefore, you have to make the mind do things that you want. It takes little practice. The best way to do it is when the mind randomly tells you do this, say no. Learn to say no. Once or twice a day, three, four times a week. And when the mind really wants to go after something, then say no. Mind says one for one time only. Say no. It says Oh, 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 yes, why are you saying no? Who taught you this no? No. <laughs> if you can practice that, mind comes under control. It's not, mind is supposed to be acting according to the will of our soul. There's a spiritual will and there's a mental will, both working in us. The spiritual will is what loves to go within and loves to go home. That, that's what causes seeking in us. The mental will wants to keep us outside. Mental will visualizes things of outside constantly. It has been going on for ever, lifetime after lifetime. What we are trying to superimpose upon it is a spiritual will. So when we want to do that, first we practice to control the mind to this extent that when it wants to do something, say no. A little practice will make the mind Submit that if I am going to say this, I'll get a no. It begins to know that. The visualization changes along with it. When you get little control over the mind, you are able to visualize what you want because the mind visualizes. You are using the same mind to visualize. There's nobody else. You, you use the mind to visualize just like you make the mind to think what you want it to think. Repetition of words itself is a method to make the mind repeat words. You don't repeat words with the tongue. So in the beginning, when you want to repeat words, the mind is repeating, the tongue also moves, because you're used to speaking like that. But eventually, when you think, the tongue doesn't move. The thoughts are also spoken by the mind. And when you try to teach the mind to speak what you want it to speak, which is meditation, when you make the mind do things that you want it to do, which it's supposed to do, the mind is a wonderful computer. You are supposed to use it. You are supposed to use the mind to think what you want to think. When you do that, then you can easily learn that when the mind is visualizing all those things which are all external, you can force it to imagine something internal. You are doing a little exercise. So many of you were able to visualize. Master, you were able to visualize some other things of your own choice. And that is because when your attention is strong, mind is under control, you can visualize whatever you like. So practice first to control the mind by learning to say no to the mind and visualization will become easier of your own choice. How can we know when it is good to speak with others regarding spiritual thoughts or experiences and when is it best to keep these things to ourselves? How can we know when it is good to speak with others regarding 
spiritual thoughts or experiences and when is it best to keep these things to ourselves best to always keep things to yourself simple answer now i can change the answer slightly <laughs> supposing our internal experiences and knowledge is like a cup being filled up with the nectar beautiful some rice drink is getting filled up every time you get more experience get more filled up and you get a few drops of it in your cup say i want to share this and there we go you are empty again if you share information your ego steps in and becomes an obstacle to you and you lose the experience but supposing you digest it great master you said digest the information digest the experiences supposing you digest it cup gets full it still keeps on filling it overflow then you share your cup is not empty but you have so much experience you can share it then sharing is okay so don't empty out yourself by getting little experience and sharing with your abundant experience share how much share what is surplus over the surface not the basic experience you have had so a cup is a good example that when it's filled up you can share when it's still empty there are only few drops you will lose even those by trying to share the the process by which this happens is because our ego gets involved i have something i am going to share with you that i become stronger and that's why it affects you dear ishwar ji my son has a good luck rock he says playfully that if you stand on it for one minute you will get one day of good luck will you speak about the value of simran sadhana devotion to the master how and what it does to help us is there a spiritual bank account and what is the exchange rate <laughs> my son has a good luck rock he says playfully that if you stood on it for one minute you get a day of good luck that's a very good exchange rate you stand one minute it gives you one day of good luck stand 10 minutes 10 minute 10 days of good luck if i stood all day i would have all life of good luck and some people really believe that there are rocks on which they sit like that and they believe that's giving them and some have been sitting on the rock all their life and then dying there <laughs> hoping to get good luck some people believe standing in a river can do that and there are many yogis in india i see them standing with one leg in the river one leg raised it's a very athletic performance and they say we are doing it to get salvation and sometimes if a big flood comes they are taken away with it by the river these are all superstitions we are so affected by superstition little little incidents happen in life and we start following them most superstitions lead us astray don't help some help us a, a superstition that if you go and have a master darshan you get benefit is a good superstition we have no, no evidence of it it's just a, just a belief it's a superstition whatever is without evidence is superstition but some superstitions turn out to be good some don't turn out to be good but supposing a superstition works do you know what has worked did the rock work or your mind worked the mind created the the result not the rock if you believe the rock can give you salvation it's the internal self that will get salvation rock is merely mere instrument there was a guy in india named dhanna they say dhanna jat got his salvation from a stone he said to himself he picked up a stone and he said they say god is in everything then god you must be in the stone also come speak to me and he took the stone he said why don't you speak to me he hit him on the head hit him on the head he got enlightened if you hit yourself with a stone you might get enlightened <laughs> at least you will see light if not enlightenment the point is that some of these things help us from our own suggestion everybody recognized today that 
suggestion, mental suggestion, is a very powerful thing. Today, even medical profession is employing it. In Japan, I went and I saw some surgeons performing surgery without anesthesia by hypnotic suggestion. They could put a person to sleep and perform a surgery. The person didn't feel any pain. So suggestion can be a very strong element. And sometimes you use an external piece of a rock or a water or this holy water. Some kind of holy water is very useful. People carry water from the river Ganges all over the world. They believe it's holy. That ceremony, they sprinkle the water. They all become holy, hallowed with the water. So these belief systems are really what are suggestions to ourselves. Sometimes they are effective. There was a holy man who came to Chicago the other day. And my wife said, let's go and listen to him. I went and saw, listened to him. Very nice man, very nice talk he gave. And, and he said, any questions? And a young woman got up. He said, I have a problem. My husband and I, we fight all the time. Is there any way that we can stop fighting and have peace in the house? He said, yes. You bring a bottle of water, I'll bless it. And there'll be peace in the house. So she went and brought a bottle of water. So he said some mantras on the water, on the bottle. Said, it's blessed now. Now take it. He's, she said, how often do I give it to my husband? <laughs> he said, not for your husband. It's for you. And I'll tell you the method of use. The method of use is, when your herb, husband starts argument, you open the bottle, take one sip, and hold it in your mouth. <laughs> don't, don't gulp it down. When he gets tired of talking, stop, then gulp, then swallow it. <laughs> If he starts again, take another sip. There'll be peace in the house. <laughs> it's like telling just a story using water as a mantra of water. What he meant was two people have to argue to have a fight. One cannot continue the fight. Two hands are needed for a clap, one doesn't do it. So that's why we are using these for suggestion, we are using these for using in our mind for various purposes. Will you speak about the value of Simran? I have spoken the value of Simran is to make the mind say the words that you choose, not the words of thought that the mind chooses. It's a way of controlling the mind. It is to put certain words into your thought stream, to push the words of thought, put the words of Simran to control the mind. That's the main purpose. Second purpose of Simran given by a perfect living master is he empowers the words he gives you to repeat. And that empowerment in those words prevents a negative entity from coming near you. If a negative entity, the negative entity is all around. The negative energy is all around us. If you are repeating those words, no negative energy can come around you. So the big benefits of the repetition of Simran. The value of sadhana. Sadhana is meditation. Sadhana is any meditation. It's called sadhana. We do perform meditation, you are in sadhana. Devotion to the master, I just talked about devotion to the master. That devotion is a response to the love you experience. When somebody loves you so unconditionally, it is automatic for us to say, we'll do anything for you. It's a natural reaction of us. It's a spiritual reaction. Therefore, the value of devotion is that you are recognizing the love that you are experiencing. So love and devotion go together, very essential part of the spiritual path. How and when does it, what does it help us? Meditation. The way we are doing meditation with love and devotion will help us to develop all this. Is there a special bank account and what is the exchange rate? There is a bank account. Here, we use currencies, dollars, rupees, trash marks, all kinds of currencies we use. The currencies that are valid at the astral plane inside are the currencies of our intentions. Good intentions, a lot of money. Bad intentions, you deplete them. So the currency of intentions works in the astral plane. You can be very rich with good intentions. So that's why they 
they talk of the power of intention. Action is what is followed up in physical world from intention. Intention occurs first. Intention creates karma, not action. If you have intention to do something, karma is created. If you act upon it, more karma is created. Because karma is being created in the mind and, and expressed in the astral plane through intention and expressed in the physical plane by action. So that's how karma works. Somebody says, I only thought of killing that man, I didn't kill him. Well, you went away with a light karma. If you killed him, it would be heavier karma. With the intention, nobody saw you, you'll be punished somewhere else. By killing, you'll be hanged right here. So there is a punishment right here. So karma is in so many different levels in which we work. The currency of intention is very important in the astral plane. You can be very rich with good intentions that you carry right here and there. But the exchange rate is like this. One man worshipped Brahma, the creator of this universe. A Hindu believer in Brahma, who is the creator, he worshipped him. He said, Brahma ji, is it true that the exchange rate is such that a million years of life on the earth is just a few moments for you? It is correct. In that case, it is also true that a million dollars is equal to a few cents for you. That's the correct exchange rate. He said, Brahmaji, will you give me a few cents? <laughs> Brahmaji said, wait a moment. <laughs> That's the exchange rate. Master, the Pralap Karma is fixed when one is born. In the Bible, Ephesians 6.12, it is written that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. How are these evil forces, witches, wizards, demons, gods, and goddesses, able to cause pain and suffering, diseases, and even death in someone? Is it per part of that person's karma? The problem of karma is fixed when one is born. Pralab karma is destiny. Destiny includes the following elements. When and where you will be born. Who will be your parents. When and where you will die. Where will you die? And, that's, and the period in between what events will take place over which you have no control. That's Pralab. That's the destiny you are born with. A bulk of our life is destiny. And things happen. We don't control where we are born. We don't control where we die. We don't control accidents. We don't control illnesses. We don't control so many things that happen in our life. They're all part of destiny and problem. In between, there are few, maybe less than 20% periods in a whole life where we have gaps and we are given the opportunity to have an experience of free will. Make a choice. It is only that part where we are making choices. Where there are choices available, we make a selection what to do, that we create a karma. Problem is all past karma. It's nothing new. But when we have those choice making, where we use so-called free will, where we feel we are choosing between options available, that's new karma coming up. Even when we intend to make a decision, karma is created. So, even with a small section, less than one-fifth of our life, we create abundant karma to create many more lives. And they become the elements from which the new problem for the future is created. In fact, we create so much karma in one lifetime, it's impossible to fit into another one lifetime. It's always surplus. So what happens to the surplus? Some part of it goes into the next life and some part is held over in a reservoir and called reserve karma. We call the pralab, the destiny we call pralab, the new karma we create we call kareman, and the one that's held up we call sinchit, sinchit karma. So karma is in three forms and is stored in the sinchit. 
supposing you lead a karma free life which means not making any decisions going with the flow like they used to say go with the flow go with the flow means whatever somebody else says follow don't use your own brain to make any decision karma free you still have plenty of karma in the sinchar to make many lives of yours that's why it's a big trap that people try to be karma free they cannot be because there's so much karma already accumulated so when you have all this karma put together it is the effect of that karma the problem creates the destiny and creates all those things when you make choices the spiritual will and the mental will come into play there is no evil outside except in your mental will there is no evil that can be created except with the mind the spiritual self never creates evil in fact spiritual self does not create any karma at all we say there is evil and good it's in the mind good and bad are being created by the mind the mind sets apart a certain section of itself which it calls conscience it determines if a thing is good or bad conscience itself has been stored over many many lifetimes and tells us it's easily affected by the environment in which we are placed by problem that means the society in which we are born and live their rules and regulations affect our conscience and determines what is good or bad conscience is a constant monitor over our karma whether good or bad evil or good and that's how we go through life attitude is not made from problem attitude is made from sincere the accumulated karma of all past lives comes together to make an attitude it's easier to set to change an event easier to take care of an event more difficult to take care of attitude an attitude we call sanskar the sanskar are like this of a person that is not sanskar are not made by one lifetime or any action is made up of all the things that have accumulated when we say we use reason to give an answer to a question we are using the data available to mind right in front of it or in recent memory when we say we use intuition intuition picks up its knowledge from san, from sanskar from sanchit using all the old accumulated knowledge in our head these are all natural functions that are being performed but when we say that when the bible describes this it says that we are going through this process and we are to fight the evil with the free choices we that we are getting and it's a spiritual doctrine that if we fight the mind if we can take control over the mind we have controlled everything they say man jeeta jag jeeta that means if you have won over the mind you won the whole world is this is law prevailing so that's the law of karma if you can overpower the mind you overpowered all this so this reference has been made over and over again in all the scriptures about the handling of evil and it's not, not only in the bible it's in all the scriptures similar instructions have been given so when we deal with evil then we deal with evil we are dealing with the mind they say there is kal have you heard there is kal and dyal kal is the negative power dyal is positive power we have both powers working in our created universe here literally translated kal means time that be the world of time the world of time is negative if there was no time there would be no negativity nothing negative can happen if there is no time in timelessness there is no negativity at all therefore time has trapped us there would be no karma if there was no time there would be no cause and effect there would be no such thing there would be no evil and good so time is the real mastermind of all evil and yet it is within time that we to find the timelessness and that's where the perfect living masters come and they take us out of this dial means the one who are operating from beyond time from beyond the creator of the universe brahma in india we say parbrahma 
beyond brahma then they say par brahma that means even beyond the creator what do you mean by beyond the creator it means there is a stage where the world of space and time does not exist brahma vishnu shiva the so called gods of beginning middle and end and everything we experience here has beginning middle and end just a translation of the words beginning middle and end into religious translation called brahma vishnu and shiva that everything that is here is generated by a beginning and sustained through a middle and then everything comes to an end so these are all subject to kal time they are all children of time on the other hand dial is beyond time because the true spirit our soul spiritual self so this battle of kal and dial battle of negative and positive has always been going on and the way to tackle with it is to fight the evil control the mind by fighting evil control mind evil will be controlled and then you go beyond that beyond the mind with the help of a perfect living master who operates from behind the mind and you are above all these things is it okay to eat non vegetarian food when it is offered to us as part of someone's desire to offer love and hospitality is it okay to eat non vegetarian food when it is offered to us as part of someone's love and hospitality and hospitality with love and hospitality somebody says drink a little poison i'll give you with love and hospitality <laughs> i'll say you are no lover of mine <laughs> you're telling me to do something you know you would know personally is not good for me so that's why if my master has told me be vegetarian i love him i can't it's so difficult for such a lover to say no to him but today i tell you if he told me to drink poison i will drink that's the extent of love can take you to that point but the masters have never said lose your common sense they have advised use common sense as you very well know there are eight senses we have five are the senses of perception which everybody uses sixth sense is intuition they say women have more of it i suppose they do they are able to over overwhelm even strong people seventh sense is common sense it is the ability to know what is important what is not and not to follow that's what is trivial so some of these things which come up bring our common sense to distinguish between what is right what is wrong what is being offered in jest what is being offered seriously so we are able to use our common sense and fight these things we don't lose our common sense just by becoming a spiritual follower there was a swami who came and met me in india he said some swamis create a strange kind of hypnotic spell on their people that they are willing to do anything the swami says they do their common sense and that swami told me a man came to me he said swami your power is not as strong as my masters my master lives in bangalore and if my master says jump from the top of the house i will jump and swami will your disciple say that he said no my disciple won't say that if i tell my disciple jump from the house he'll say master you jump first <laughs> so don't lose common sense that we have to act according to whatever wisdom has been given to us to distinguish between the uh, different options that come before us but as i said right in the beginning one who loves you will not ask you to take something that you don't you know you don't want to take so if you are a vegetarian on principle because your master has told you then if somebody says i'm giving you with love i'll say i return it with love and i'll give you little more good vegetarian food instead you also eat my vegetarian food something like that but if my master says eat i'll eat it 
I'm not saying diet, diet is not controlling our spirituality. You have to remember that part. What's the importance of vegetarian food? Are you going to become vegetarian, become spiritual? I have seen the most angry, the most evil people were vegetarians. Vegetarianism does not make you spiritual. No kind of diet will ever you make you spiritual. I went to Japan, I met a Zen group there, Zen Buddhist group. They said the secret of spirituality is in this grain of rice. We eat this particular rice and we get enlightened. I said, wonderful, let's spread this rice all over, everybody will be enlightened. Can a grain of rice take us to something that is so wonderful inside us, not outside? That does not make you spiritual, no matter what diet you are taking. Vegetarianism is not spirituality. Why do we then encourage, why do masters say, be vegetarian? Very simple reason. That when you eat something, any food, we have to eat food to survive. The physical world is based upon nutrition coming from food. Every living form survives on other living form. Even plants have living, are, are living form. Vegetables are also living, coming from living source. You see, the big animals, predators killing small animals. Big fish eat small fish. Small fish eat small vermins. They eat something else which is living. They eat plants and everybody, everything here is living on extinguishing life of some kind. We vegetarians extinguish life of vegetables, vegetarian kingdom. The difference is that in all these forms of life, the level of awareness is different. The level of awareness or awakening is different. Plants have less awakening. Insects and birds, they are more. Mammals have more. Human beings have even more. What happens when you extinguish life, any life? It affects your power to concentrate attention. You can examine it in any way. For example, you are reading a book and your rate of reading is one page per minute. Go and kill a man and read the same book. You won't go over one page. The mind will be affected. Your concentration will be scattered. Why? Because you extinguish in life, it affects your power of concentration. It takes a while to get back. If you kill an animal, same thing happens at a lesser degree. You kill a bird, still lesser degree. You kill an insect, even lesser degree. Eat a vegetable, still lesser degree. It's not that uh, nothing affects you. Everything will affect your power of concentration. But when you extinguish life at the lowest level, the effect on the power of concentration is the least. Since our meditational process depends upon the concentration of attention inside, therefore, the food we take affects us. Now that's one reason. Now remember, it's merely what food you eat. It's also the quantity of what you eat. You are a glutton vegetarian, you're still affecting your power of concentration. You feed yourself so much, you can't even keep awake, you can't even concentrate, it affects. So it's not being merely vegetarian, it's not a ritual or something. It's something that if you take light foods, so this is called Sattvic Bhajan, Bhajan, Sattvic Bhajan was light, good food that is healthy for you and also least disturbing to your power of concentrating your attention. It will be the best for meditation. It's purely for practical reasons that the masters have said, take this kind of light food, it will help you in your meditation. If you're not a meditator, go and eat what you like. But if you want to do meditation, it will help you to eat light, simple vegetarian food. What do you think about so many spiritual paths being run like a business? It has become so difficult to find the genuine ones. What do you think about so many spiritual paths being run like a business that becomes so difficult to find the genuine ones. The truth is, masters come. They come with their seekers. They don't come to set up any religion. No master has ever set up a religion. They don't come to set up a separate group. 
they don't come to set up societies they come to pick up their marked sheep take them back home they come to help those who are marked to travel the way that they teach and take them back home the role is very simple when their following grows the people around them start making it a religion and start making it official societies start emphasizing the importance of outside things more than the original message ultimately they all run into the same problem of becoming religious institutions running on business lines this is not new look at history from the beginning of history that we know till today it has happened after every master who came and left a great spiritual message for humanity we can find it down to a small group found a small religion and said this was for us no master has ever given a teaching for any group is given for humanity nor has he ever distinguished between any caste creed nationality color anything he has always given his message to all all are the children of the same creator he did never distinguish between them but after him we formed small groups and we say our master is the only one all others are fake that's one beauty i found when i studied religions comparative religions a subject at harvard university they had a very big library prince princeton library they had very big library and i studied for my own education and i found studied about 11 or 12 big religions i said there must be lot of common things with them do you know the common thing the only common thing i found was each one said we are the only true one all others are false and each one said this the followers of the masters all say our master is the only one all others are fake what is this how do you know about anything how do you know about masters who can recognize a master i tell you truthfully if somebody can recognize a master he is a master himself we have such a big difficulty to recognize a master in fact we cannot you are asking is it difficult to find yes i it is impossible is it possible to find a perfect living master only a perfect living master can find us that's why it said in india when the chela is ready the guru appears they never say when a chela is ready he can find a master he can find a guru when you are ready a master appears and your still mind still doubts mind will still fight but the, it's the unconditional love of that master that overpowers the mind and then you are you are found and then you say i have found you still feel i have found it is like supposing a group of blind people are locked up in a room it is all flush the door there is only one door and that's also flush with the wall and they are blind they can't see each one say there is a door we are trying to open and they go groping with their hands all over the wall every time they go the door it looks like a wall they pass we don't know where the door is then quietly a man with eyes who can see walks in he closes the door and he finds all these people groping around looking for the door and he finds one guy has really people say there is somebody amongst us who has just come in he'll be able to guide us but we don't know who he is because they are blind they are still searching now instead of searching the door they are also searching this guy when this guy says this man has been going round and round so much he holds his hand the man says blind man says i found him <laughs> i found him he didn't find him the man with the eyes found the blind man this is our state when a master comes into our life we say we found a master that's not true the master found us how can you find a master if he lives exactly like us is like us somebody wrote a letter to me from bangalore he said i saw master i saw you he told me i said i am not a master but he said i saw you and i offered you three things can you tell me what those things are then i will know that you really are there 
otherwise all made up and i said of course i don't know i am just like you how do you expect me supposing i am able to guess what is what you are given me inside you know what i'll become a psychic a mind reader i won't be even a disciple of this man i'll be doing something so totally different this is the quality the master to be so ordinary i said i can't guess as a friend i can ask you what did you give me <laughs> he said sorry for asking that question i gave you flowers and i gave you a glass of water with lemon in it and i gave you some cookies i said i enjoyed them <laughs> he asked me how do i then know that the master received them i said were you repeating the words your master gave i was repeating the words while i was giving the offering he said as to receive them i said i gave a generic answer already there was generic answer it could apply to anybody but the truth is at that time i acknowledged it so it's we can't find a master there's one master or tulsi sahab tulsi sahab said je koi kahe sant ko chhina hath kaan par dina if somebody says i can find a master put your hand on your ear don't even listen to him so he's telling the problem of finding a master you can only be found by seeking a master thank you very much we'll take up remaining questions later and we have a lunch break thank you <laughs>